Hello, welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle Pelazon, your host and the head witch in charge here at Holisticism. And I'm just happy that you're here. Thanks for tuning in. Hi. Big hug. Big virtual hug to you. We are focusing on the idea of multiplicity in spirituality on the podcast over the next couple of weeks. We had an excellent episode with Manoj on Tuesday from Open. Manoj is one of the co-founders of Open. And oh, I just love him so much. He's so fucking and we talked about this idea of multiplicity, right? And that we can embody many different things at the same time. I don't know, dude. I feel like we need the whole tree and the branches and the leaves. We don't just need the leaves. We don't just need the roots. We need all of it, right? The roots are super important, no doubt. But like, so is the tree. <laughs> so are the branches. So are the leaves. So are the birds on the leaves. Anyways, this idea of multiplicity and embodying multiple different things, many aspects of ourselves as opposed to reducing down and getting smaller and taking up less space, what if we expanded into those branches? What if we stretched ourselves a little bit more to those edges, those, uh, as Emily Russo says, our cosmic edges, right? And those curves and those cracks and fissures and little spaces, those prismatic elements of who we are. And instead of trying to hide the light from them, shining a light on them and letting them be and knowing that like, we can be expansive. We can be many things that might feel mm, contraindicatory to each other at the same time. And I wanted to like do a micro focus on this idea when and, and bring up the idea of neuroaesthetics. So here's my gripe. I think there are a lot of really intuitive, creative, thoughtful, squiggly brained, witchy people out there who love beautiful things, who love design, who love who are visual, right? Who are visual learners. And when we prescribe to the reducing down effect, <laughs> reducing down version of authenticity, then we would say, you know what? I'm going to reduce myself down to, I love beautiful things. And I think that when we, when we do that, we have to acknowledge that she loves the binary, right? A world that loves black and white thinking and that, you know, to be honest, many of us love black and white thinking because it or either or thinking, whatever you want to call it, because it's easier. It's easier to say, well, anything that is not this thing is wrong or anything that falls under the category of red is dangerous. Everything that falls under the category of green is healthy for me. When we know that's not not really true. Right. But when we have these sort of broad sweeping rules, it makes it much easier for us to walk throughout the world because we don't have to make decisions and choices about every single thing that we come into interaction with, whether it's a person or a company or a, a space or a type of food, right? If we can sort of just file it or categorize it as one thing, then we don't need to think about it contextually and we don't need to sort of re-engage with it and what our relationship is to it every single time we come into contact with it. And in many ways, that's a really good thing <laughs> because it can really slow us down if we have to, every time we come in, in contact with an apple, be like, but are apples good or are apples bad? Do I like apples or do I not like apples? <laughs> right? And if we just know, okay, I like green apples. Great. Every time you see a green apple, you're like, cool, I think I'm going to take that. Oh, great. Easy. But the truth is like, really, <laughs> kind of depends. Right? You probably don't want to eat a green apple right before you're going to like go have a gigantic, delicious meal with your friends. Because you don't want to be full. Or maybe, like, after you get a root canal, you don't really want to bite into a green apple. As delicious and crispy as it might be and as healthy, literally healthy as it might be, it might not be good for your teeth. That nuance is confusing. It takes a lot of energy from us. So we tend to stay on the black and white. And when I think, going back to intuitive, creative, people who love things that, are, that feel aesthetic, right, that are aesthetic. When we love design, when we love structure, when we love architecture, when we love color, when we love fashion, it's... In this binary world, often reduced down to being vapid or stupid or not meaningful and unreasonable and irrational and not utilitarian, right? Not useful. And we know that we live in a world of capitalism that loves productivity and usefulness. And so, therefore, it's not valuable. And we might, if we subscribe to this idea of reducing ourselves down to one version, right, our authentic quote-unquote version, we might think, okay, well, I love beautiful things. I love aesthetics. They matter to me, which means that 
I'm not smart or I can't love math or I can't, um, you know, design is more important to me. Aesthetics are more important to me. So I don't have a brain for the logical stuff or for the businessy stuff or for really anything that's not aesthetic. And that sounds silly, right? Because I'm being extremely glib about it, but really our unconscious does kind of act like this. So in this example, I am a super intuitive person and creative person just like you. And I love design and I love beautiful things and I love art and aesthetics really matter to me. And when I log into some of the apps that I use or the platforms that I had to use to start holisticism or that I used to use at tech companies to help them run their businesses, things like Excel spreadsheets and QuickBooks and Google Drive and Gmail and God. I don't know, like your banking app, right? They were so ugly. They were so ugly. And, you know, filling out an Excel spreadsheet, I was just like, oh, every part of my body is rejecting this. Like my, I, on a cellular level, I am just, this, tor- this is torturous. And I, I used to sort of like throw the baby out with bathwater and be like, well, I just hate numbers or I just hate building P&Ls or I just hate, you know, doing financial projections when in reality what I didn't like was how Excel looked and that it wasn't aesthetically pleasing to me and you might be like that sounds so stupid it's not stupid (laughs) that's what I'm saying we've been taught that these are binary ideas that we have to choose between something looking beautiful or something being a utility and useful and I'm telling you you don't have to subscribe to that rule if you don't want to And because we live in that binary space, I wonder if a lot of us who are intuitive and creative and just witchy, magical people who design and aesthetics really matter to us, if many of the things that we've shied away from, things like making spreadsheets and looking at our bank statements and, I don't know, like HR software and task management software like Asana or ClickUp or whatever, if we shied away from these entire huge things, huge ideas, just because we don't like one element of them. And that's the aesthetic version of them, right? Now, we know that neuroaesthetics matters. So this is not stupid. Even if part of you thinks this is really dumb, because maybe you're like me and you've been taught forever that caring about how you look or caring about how the space around you looks is silly and not worthwhile. I just want you to put a pin in that. That is a totally fine thought and perspective. And that can be true and real for you. And that can be what you subscribe to and what you 100% believe. And maybe when you get to the end of this podcast, you're like, yeah, that was bullshit. I still believe what I believe. Design doesn't matter. And it's silly. It's a waste of time. Great. That's totally fine. But let's put a pin in any judgment that we might have around aesthetics and their value or their necessity and also our connotation with people who care about aesthetics. So let's just like brush that aside for a sec. And let's look at something tangible like neuroaesthetics. Neuroaesthetics is the impact that things that are aesthetic, like design and architecture, have on our brains. And physiologically and also intellectually, mentally, and our conscious and unconsciousness. Okay, so you've heard us talk about open on the podcast over the past few weeks. And... Honestly, we just can't get enough of them. So today I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this class that I took this week. That was a stretch class with Lee He. And I mean, I hate stretching. I never stretch after runs, workouts. I know it's like flossy and you're supposed to do it. I just can't bring myself to do it if someone is not forcing me to stretch. So I saw this class and was like, you know what? This is the perfect opportunity to do this in community, to get the holisticism hub on there and to stretch together. And oh my gosh, it kind of felt like a lullaby and I had no idea how badly I needed to stretch. And similar to every other class that Open has, there was really awesome music incorporated. He was on their futuristic looking set. You feel like you're on another planet. It's very pretty to look at. Their outfits are always coordinated and neuroaesthetic, you know, they matter. They get you into the zone. So if meditation isn't your thing, maybe a little movement is, and you could do a little stretching, do a little Pilates. Who doesn't want to feel snatched after a little Pilates class? Go check it out in our show notes, 30 days free with the code holisticism or just grab the link. And I highly 
highly recommend checking them out. Get your snatch on. If you want to join us in community class, we are doing a breathwork class on Thursday, August 26th with Manoj, 20 minutes. We're also doing a meditation on Tuesday, August 31st with Allison Simon, 15 minutes, just a little dip your toe into meditation. So join us. Let us know how your practice is going and we'll see you in class. I talked to my advisor, Ivy Ross, who is an incredible designer, amazing business person, is the director of design at Google. We talk about neuroaesthetics a lot because she really cares about them. And she's seen a direct correlation in how beautiful or aesthetic something is with its use and the pleasure that people get from it. This is like what she studies all day long. And I love art and aesthetics and beautiful things. And I love using my brain. <laughs> And um, I love things that have utility, too. And we know that the way a space looks impacts how we feel and also how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about that space. There's a great book called the Architecture of Happiness and by Alain de Botan, and it talks even more about this, in particular around architecture, obviously, and how Gothic art style architecture versus brutalist style architecture versus modern architecture, how it makes us feel and why, what it evoke, what emotions it evokes in us. And if we want to go like super granular, think about fluorescent lights. There is proof that fluorescent lighting increases levels of anxiety and depression. It is related to migraines and headaches. It's related to increased inflammation throughout the body. These are legit scientific studies. And who knows if it's causation or correlation. Either way, fluorescent lights impact us negatively. And so we know that neuroaesthetics is real, whether it's the actual structure, right, or if it's the emotional sort of relationship that we have to a thing. It, imp- it makes a difference for us. Even if we don't think that design matters, even if we don't value aesthetics, it still makes an impact on us. So imagine for those of us who are visual learners or who are artists or who are super creative or for who design really, really matters or, or maybe who are tactile learners who need to feel things and see things in a specific way organized spatially. Imagine how much aesthetics really do play a role in how we show up in the world. And To bring you back, to land you back down in this example of using something like an Excel spreadsheet that you think is so ugly and terrible, and you have this horrible visceral reaction, full body reaction to the idea of even sitting down with your finances. And I wonder if instead of going black and white and saying, well, finances, I'm just bad at those because I'm creative, or I'm intuitive, or I'm a witch, I'm magical. And finances always make me feel bad, right? Extreme thinking white, black or white thinking, if we can get into the nuance, if we can get into the multiplicity there and say, well, I don't know if it is actually the finance part. I don't know if it's actually the building of the P&L. I don't know if it's the thinking about how to grow my business that makes me feel icky. I don't know if it's the future visioning of what it will be like when I have this money that I say that I want. I don't know if it's that or if it's the framework that it comes in, if it's this ugly system, this ugly container that I have to put it in, that's really impacting my feelings. And I think this might like kind of drive us a little bit crazy because we start to wonder, whoa, whoa, where are these feelings coming from? But I also think that that's quite valid (laughs) to begin to investigate why is it that I feel the way that I feel? And do I have more control over this than I previously realized. If we care about visuals, if we are really intuitive, creative, squiggly brained people, tactile learners or visual learners, and we recognize that aesthetics matter to us, then we kind of know that anything that's not aesthetically pleasing is going to be sort of inflammatory to our senses. It's going to be, it's going to cause us to sort of be like riled up or like incensed or just aggravated. Aggravated is a good word. And it might be low grade aggravation that we don't even really notice. We're not like, oh, this is so ugly. We sort of deal with it because we've spent our whole lives sort of dealing with systems and situations and maybe computer platforms or spaces or clothes or uniforms that 
just have this low level of aggravation that we have to deal with because we didn't know that there was something else out there for us. We didn't know there was another option. So we've cut ourselves off from that, right? And what I would like to invite you to do, maybe if you are an aesthetic person like me, just start to become aware of that. It doesn't really matter to you. Like, where are you aggravating yourself or not setting yourself up for success? If you don't like the way Excel looks, like there's many ways to look at your numbers and many platforms to build out models that are beautiful. And you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater and just say, well, I'm bad at numbers. I don't like Excel because I don't like Excel. So I'm just not going to do any of my financial planning. I'm not going to like try and um, track my KPIs. I'm, I'm just not going to do any of that because I don't really like it. That makes no sense. It's like saying, I don't like books written by white men in the thirties and I just like don't like books. So I'm just not going to read books. <laughs> like that does, that's not the same thing. I would probably even like double click on that white men in the thirties. Is there a specific one you don't like? There's probably some great books written by white men in the thirties. Maybe not, but let's just, I don't know. We have to like throw everything away. Again, these super extremes that we live by that is black and white thinking. That's this idea of authenticity, right? Oh, I'm reduced down to this one thing. But when we reduce down to the one thing, we are like, we are sucking the air and the complexity out of the rest of our lives. Cause we're just like reducing down to this thick syrup. I don't want to be that. <laughs> I want to be expansive and I want to have lots of notes and flavors and different ways to be tasted and enjoyed and different ways for me to taste and enjoy the world and, and articulate myself in the world. My takeaway for you is to start thinking about neuroaesthetics and how it shows up in your life. And next week we're going to talk about archetypes and costumes and why embodying an archetype and a co using a costume to do so can help you collapse the timeline. And this really plays into the idea of aesthetics, obviously, and how things look and feel. And for your homework for this week, I want you to start thinking about the areas of your life, maybe in your business, maybe in something else that weren't meant for you, you know, weren't crafted in, with you in mind, that didn't take into consideration your sensitivity to beauty or to sound or to light or to a certain flavor or to a specific structure. We're talking about this in Notion for Magical Bodies, how for so many of us who have squiggly brains or ADHD or who are not neurotypical, we have been forced to live in systems that weren't made for us and, and play by the rules of these systems. And it makes us feel like failures, right? And it, it's hard. It's really, really hard, unnecessarily hard. And systems are basically built to get you to a desired outcome. And there are many ways to get to, to those desired outcomes. Maybe for the, the example that I've used today is the desired outcome of like understanding your finances, right? So usually the system to do that is making Excel spreadsheets so you see what your finances look like. But there's more than one way to do that, to understand your finances for your intuitive business or for your life. And instead of what we tend to do when we don't feel like we're accepted by a system or a system isn't made for us, we basically eschew that system and the desired outcome that goes with it. We just say, like, I don't want that thing anymore. Instead, what we can do is say, you know what, this system doesn't exactly work for me. It's not made for me. So I need to figure out a system that does work for me. And the more I know myself and acknowledge all of my multiplicity, the better I know who I am. I have self-knowledge. And I can build things to support myself. I can build systems or a life or rituals or space or a wardrobe or anything in my life to support me and who I am and all my dynamism. And I can get to my desired outcome because I know that I'm going to need to take a different route or path. And the way that everyone else does it is not going to work for me. But that doesn't mean that I can't get to the same outcome as them. It just means I'm going to have to take a different route. And there's nothing wrong with that. And for so long, we've subscribed to black or white thinking, either or thinking, where you're either logical or you're creative. You're either intelligent or you love fashion, right, or design. And we can be all of these things. And often the systems around us are reducing down of what the average person needs, the average thing is. And when we reduce down, we lose all of that dynamic flavor and color and texture and magic. So, of course, the average system isn't going to work for you. And the answer is not to reduce yourself down and make yourself smaller. 
The answer is to take up all the space, acknowledge all the aspects of you, all, all your multiplicity, all of the things that don't make sense about who you are, but do make sense because they're you. And start creating for that instead of what you're not. Start to build and create for who you are. And then I think life starts to get a little bit easier and you just get to have a little bit more compassion for yourself and other people when you can do that. So I want to hear from you. Let me know what you think of this episode. And I mean, I gave you some homework, but I want you to really start thinking about how you as a sensitive, energetic being are impacted by things that you maybe didn't allow yourself to realize that you're sensitive to. And maybe start looking at the things that you wrote off as not for you, like completely wrote off and start to pinpoint like, well, what exactly was it? Am I not a party person or am I just not like a person who likes to go to parties in downtown LA where there are a ton of drugs? <laughs> maybe I'm great at house parties, right? And so what have I been cutting off about myself, my, my party person? <laughs> Because I just lumped that element of who I am into this like sort of big umbrella when in reality it was a very specific circumstance or system or situation that wasn't working for me. And how can I expand my life a little bit more? Let's just, let's, let's just like squeeze the juice out of life. What do, you, what do you say? All right. That's all I have for you. And I cannot wait for next week's episode oh, with Ali Maz. And this is really good. I'm really excited about archetypes and costumes and telling you more about that. So. Tune in next Friday because this is very important, very key. I've been, I've been hinting about it on Instagram for a while, but I want to dive even deeper into it. So, and you've been asking for it. So that's next week on the podcast. It's going to be great. Okay. That's it. I love you so much. Have a great rest of your Friday and I'll see you in the next. Bye.